Um, my name is Anand Kanagala. I'm a software engineer at Google and not a cryptographer. I am going to talk about um, a system that's been built by over multiple years by a team of cryptographers, software engineers, and site reliability engineers, um, which underlies a lot of the privacy and um, security infrastructure at Google. Um, I think um, some of my colleagues, I think Bodo and Hannes, are in the audience somewhere. Uh, they'll probably <coughs> can answer questions that I won't be able to do it. Uh, just to head off any confusion, this talk is not about the Google Cloud KMS, despite the name, the two separate bees. Um, the Google Cloud KMS is um, a system used by clients of Google Cloud, whereas the system I'm going to talk about is the Google internal KMS, which is used by <coughs> systems at Google, including the Cloud KMS. Right. First, uh, a quick intro to the context of uh, the KMS I'm going to talk about. It's going to be the system in green uh, box here. Uh, there's a hierarchy, there's a key hierarchy at Google, and that's mapped. Um, that has this is a parallel set of systems that meet the, sorry, this thing is falling off. Um, there's a parallel hierarchy of systems implementing um, the trust hierarchy. So at the top of the thing, you see the, uh, the boxes in blue. Those are our storage systems. Those are, uh, and the numbers in parentheses are the set number of tasks that exist at that layer. So there's you know, millions of processes that implement the storage systems. Um, a layer down is the KMS that I'm going to talk about, which is the production. There's tens of thousands of those. Um, a layer below that is the root KMS, and below that is uh, a distribution system for the distributing the uh, root ma KMS master key, and there's a few hundred of those. Um, so again, going back to the top, storage systems, when they are encrypting data, chunk it up, generate a, um, a random data encryption key, encrypt the data, write the ciphertext to disk, and then take the data encryption key and call out to the KMS, which will wrap the key and return the wrap key back to the um, storage system. Uh, <clears throat> and so the wrapping is performed using um, what's termed the KE key here, key, key encrypting key here, which never leaves the, the KMS. Um, and similarly, it turtles all the way down until the very bottom, where um, we're down to a, a single key, which is the root of trust, and it's stored in a few physical safes if we ever need to, um, if, if all of Google were to re restart. Um, but beyond that, is it's just held only in RAM in a few hundred machines around the world. Um, so this begs the question, though, right, is why do you want to use a KMS? The core motivation is that uh, code needs secrets, and there aren't really very many good options. Um, one of the things that you'd see in a lot of open source is you store it in, in the code repository, but that sucks from a security point of view. Um, you find a bunch of secrets in GitHub. Um, storing it on production hard drives is not much better. It's, it doesn't help on the security point of view, and it's an operational nightmare, and you still have to manage all those secrets anyway. Um, so you still need this thing. So the best alternative is to, uh, that we've settled on is to use a centralized uh, key management system where you use our identity uh, process and system identity management system along with our Borg scheduling system to manage who gets access to these keys. Right, this allows you to solve this problem once for, oops. <coughs> solve uh, the problem once for everybody, uh, for, for all our systems, right? So you can decide you know, who gets access to these keys. Uh, is it humans? Is it services? Um, many of our keys are restricted only to services that are built verifiably. Humans will never see these keys. Um, how do you impose this? It's, it's a single choke point that allows us to do the auditing, logging, and control. Uh, we can minimize the amount of code that needs to deal with keys. It's much easier to uh, secure. And the separation of trust because we're able to exclude any of the lower level storage systems um, that need access to this, that, that could even have access to this. Right? But what could go wrong? Um, 
in Jan, I mean, G Gmail ha has something like a, 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 over a billion monthly active users, and in January of 2014, there was an outage where, um, where people weren't able to access Gmail for anywhere between 15 minutes to um, uh, up to two hours for some people. The root cause of it was um, that a configuration file for the key management service that I'm talking about was truncated uh, in error, and suddenly the key management system did not know about most of the keys uh, that it was normally handles. And since Gmail encrypts all of this data using keys that are held by the KMS, nobody could read their email. Um, we we always knew, so actually, back up. So the, the hiccup in our system was only about 15 minutes or so, and it recovered, but it led to cascading failures, and by the time the entire system was brought back up, it was up to a little over two hours or so before it came back up. So uh, we always knew the KMS was important and availability was important, but uh, this really got uh, a lot of attention at Google. We learned a bunch of things, and the rest of the talk is going to be about what we learned and how we fix some of these issues. Um, so in normal operation, clients access the, uh, the key management server through an RPC mechanism, and the KMS serves up the keys based on local config um, that it has. But the way this thing is assembled is that every one of the teams that uses the KMS, every one of the services run by the teams, maintain their own configurations, and they store them in our version control system, source repository. And these are packaged up, merged together, packaged up, and sent out to um, all of our serving replicas worldwide. And since teams want to make their changes for velocity, we update these multiple times an hour. I think you can see where this is going. Um, we had a problem, um, some, <clears throat> some latent timing issue tickled a bug in the merging code uh, that had been latent for a couple of years, and the bad config, the truncated config, got pushed globally. Nobody had their keys. Um, a lot of the systems went down. Um, so the lessons we learned was that over time, the KMS had become a single point of failure. It had become a startup dependency for many services. They would not start unless their keys were available. And even if they did start, they had a runtime dependency where if you did not have access to the keys, you wouldn't be able to serve traffic, right? So this led to the realization that the KMS could not or should not fail um, globally. Um, to achieve this, we ended up having to do a bunch of changes. This summarizes some of the, uh, the important ones. So we eliminated the global control plane. We changed how we roll out binaries and configurations. We no longer update uh, changes, uh, make changes globally in under 15 minutes. Um, it, we've changed it to, it, it takes at least a week or so before we roll things out or gradually, the using the usual 1, 5, 10, uh, 50 percent uh, ratios. We've also minimized dependencies and we've had to um, differ aggressively against our dependencies not being available as well. Um, and also to deal with um, at the scale at which this operates at, uh, due to traffic shifts, we've had to implement regional isolation so that uh, one of the regions being overloaded or being in trouble, that does not cause it to do the cascading failure into any of the other regions. So we had to do this for the KMS, and we had to do it for all of our dependencies as well. Um, so I, I think we talked about the availability. So these are some of the other requirements that impact to our design. The uh, we talked about availability. Um, the number that we were asked to meet was that we needed uh, something like, was that five and a half nines of uh, percentage of the requests that we serve. This is not based on time directly. Of the requests that we serve should be served successfully. So that means that, um, and this is measured on an hourly uh, interval. So if you serve a million requests, we are allowed to serve five errors in that interval. Uh, we serve way more than that, but I think. Um, on the latency side, we, 
the, the, at the 99th percentile, the request latency needs to be less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, for comparison, the reason this number is arrived at is uh, human perception somewhere in the order of 100 milliseconds, and a user-level operation may translate into multiple op operations at the, at the KMS level. So you need to be able to budget for that. Um, scalability, well, we need to meet all of, all of Google's needs. That's uh, a thing. Um, I'll touch on security. I'll touch on only one of the security requirements that we have. I mean, I'm not going to talk about all the other ones as it impacts um, availability. And that is being able to do uh, key rotation at scale um, in as full proof of manner as you can. The last one is efficiency, which is, you know, what's the performance you can get out of, out of your course? This isn't as important because if you can meet the scalability requirement, you can always deploy more. It's a cost and minimizing it will reduce the cost of our service, the footprint and cost of our service. Um, so, yeah, we already talked about most of the uh, availability thing. I'll touch on the latency and scalability uh, parts of it. Uh, so we want to be able to encrypt everything, at all the data. That requires that you have a high, highly available service. And the other requirements are scale and uh, latency. So we have a few choices that we can deal with. Um, what is the granularity of encryption? Um, if you have a, a system that uses a few, a few keys to encrypt a lot of data, you are no longer as dependent on the availability of the, of the KMS. On the other hand, you, the amount of logging and auditing that you can do is much coarser, and you have to trust the clients to do the right thing. On the converse, uh, in terms of rate of change, clients, if you could allow clients to manage the keys at this thing, you will end up with, you can end up with, um, uh, so you can play with this at the different you know, levels in the trust hierarchy, right? So if clients manage their keys and they can change them much more frequently, that's okay, because if that's messed up, it's only a single client that goes down, potentially, and at the KMS level, we manage keys at a much more um, slower rate, which I mentioned you know, with the one-week rotation period, uh, one-week uh, change management period. Um, so that combined with a um, couple of insights, right? One is that if we do this thing one week, at least a, a minimum of a week to roll the changes out, at the KMS layer, the key material is no longer mutable. That combined with the fact that uh, if you can combine it with key wrapping at the KMS layer, we end up with a stateless server for that, that period of the week. So that allows us to uh, scale trivially. It's, it's very easy to bring up you know, N thousand instances of these. There is no coordination required between them, and so that's, that's one way of fetching scaling. In terms of keys, because of wrapping, at the KMS layer, we manage in the order of uh, you know, tens of thousands of keys, which means we can hold them in RAM, uh, which implies we can meet our latency budget as well. Right. So that, uh, that addresses the um, <coughs> thing. So what we ended up with was um, infrastructure for managing secrets, SSL certs, uh, crypto keys, passwords. But primarily, it's a wrapping and unwrapping service that takes the data encryption keys that I've talked about that the storage services generate and wraps them with the key encryption keys that are held by the KMS and that never leave the service. Um, so we meet many of the security requirements. It's not a traditional database or storage system because updates happen via the uh, version, version control system in a completely separate path than the serving system. And you'll also see why this matters um, further down when I talk about rotation. Um, and finally, it's not a data encryption service because uh, we, the KMS only deals with keys and clients deal with the, the bulk data operation. So we're able to keep our um, tail latencies uh, under control. So, uh, so, so I'll hit on the, uh, you know, how we meet these requirements. Uh, I'm happy to say that We've had no downtime since that outage uh, in 2014, early 2014. We serve um, our measured availability is uh, is much greater than six nines, and so we serve in the order of you know we're allowed to actually measured let's say on an hourly interval. We serve trillions of requests, and we serve on the dozens of errors or so. So you can.
Um, and many of these are not necessarily due to um, uh, server-side issues, but anyway. On the latency side, um, uh, in a 99.9 .9 at the 99.9 .9 percentile, most of the request latency is under 200, millisec 200 microseconds. Um, and the reason I already hinted at this, we use, um, it's held in RAM, that helps, and two, it's symmetric repro, because we handle all of the, we own all the keys. The, on the scalability side, um, I hit on this, so we serve the order of you know, um, tens of millions of requests per second, um, and we use on the order of tens of thousands of processes and cores to, uh, to achieve this. On the efficiency, right, on the throughput per core, uh, depending on the request mix and depending on the processor architecture they're running on, we get somewhere between four and 12,000 uh, requests per second. So, I mean, I think that meets, uh, I think, yeah, that covers all the uh, uh, performance requirements to talk about. I'd like to talk about the, uh, <coughs> the key rotation requirement that uh, we put in and how it impacts availability. So the first is, right, where do people rotate keys? Where do you want to rotate keys? Uh, the two common cases are key compromise or the cipher is broken. Either, both of which obviously require access to the cipher text, which is typically access restricted by the storage systems um, because you have other storage jackals of that layer. Um, in any case, if you were able to rotate your keys, you are able to limit the window of vulnerability, whether you detect it or not. And so we end up rotating uh, quite often. But it happens that rotating keys is fairly error prone, and if you mess up, it leads to data loss, and so, which leads to our goals, which is that we want our, KM, our clients of the KMS to design with rotation in mind when they're designing their system. So that's one of the goals for us. We also want to make it trivially easy to, to use um, multiple key versions. So it ought to be no harder to do that than using a single key version. And we want to make it foolproof, it should be very, very hard for them to lose data. And the way we get to do that is that uh, the first one forces, forces our uh, clients to think about what rotation frequency, uh, rotation right up front. They need to specify the frequency of the rotation. What do they want to do every 30 days, 90 days, whatever, they, whatever meets their uh, requirements. And they also need to specify the TTL of the ciphertext that they generate. It could be, there's a whole range of numbers, 30 days to every year, whatever they guarantee, right? Given that clients choose those, uh, the KMS guarantees a safety condition, which is basically that so long as clients do not try to access uh, or decipher or decrypt uh, ciphertext that was, produced, that was produced within this TTL window, the KMS will have a key set that will be able to decipher that text. Right. So, so basically, clients generate ciphertext, and so up until the TTL, um, so until the TTL window is expired, the KMS will have a key version that they can use to decipher it. I mean, that's a guarantee that we provide, right? Um, so the first, and then the last one is, uh, and it's, it's, uh, this is tightly integrated with uh, Google's standard crypto library, which supports multiple key versions, and each of those key versions could be a different cipher to, to provide our ability to rotate away in case you know, some weakness in the cipher is detected. Um, so this meets uh, the three goals. The, the first one is basically you know, forces our clients to you know, design with rotation in mind. Um, the last one, sorry, right. The multiple key versions is met by the third uh, library, uh, third bullet here, and uh, we make it very hard for them to lose their data. And there are a bunch of safeguards that I'll go into. Uh, so the way we implement this is, this is a pretty busy slide. I'll walk you through this. Um, given the, the parameters, uh, the frequency rotation and the TTL of the uh, ciphertext, the KMS derives the number of key versions that we need to retain. Right. And then it, it adds key versions, promotes, demotes, and deletes these things over time. Um, and the generation and deletion of these things is, is completely separate from the serving system. Um, remember I mentioned that customers, uh, clients of the uh, KMS manage, uh, define the parameters that they need in our VCS, so we interface through the same system to these things. So we have a separate system that manages this rotation, and that interfaces in an identical manner with the serving system. 
Right? And this thing is rolled out slowly, um, as always. So uh, I'll walk you through this diagram, the way it works. So in the table, uh, K1 through K4 are key versions for a single key. So every time I've used key in the last 10 minutes or so, um, I was really referring to it as a key set, which consists of multiple key versions, which any key version uh, can be in one of three states. It could be either active, primary, or the SFR, which is scheduled for revocation. All the key versions, any of these, independent of the state, any of these keys may be used for decryption, but only the primary key is used for encryption. So in this, one, in this key set, time goes from left to right. Um, at T0, we introduce a, a K1. It's marked as active. It gets rolled out over a week to all of our you know, tens of thousands of services. And if anybody were to access it at the beginning of the, beginning of the rotation period, you know, one of the services servers might have access to this key, um, and the rest of them would not. At the end of the week, all of them would have it, right? So the next generation period, uh, that key version gets promoted to primary, right? And again, you know, the first day, some you know, one person to the servers will have access to this key, and you would be able to start encrypting data with it. But because we guarantee, we, what we achieve is that in the previous time period, we were ensured that that key version is available at all the keys. So it, even though it cannot be used for um, encryption, it's available for decryption. So any writer, so any reader will be able to write da uh, read data that was written by one of the keys that has access to this thing. Okay. Um, and time T2, at the end of the week, everybody would have access to it uh, again, but they have access to the key material itself. At T2, we introduce um, another key version, K2, a similar pattern. Um, and as you can see, it just uh, follows another thing. This is just one of, one of uh, schedules. We can do. There, are, there are trade offs in terms of vulnerability windows and uh, how fast you want to do this. There are other schemes that you can come up with, but this is just a simpler, simple way of doing this. Um, so a couple of things to note. Um, we do not require transactional semantics for key generation because the rollout ensures that every reader will have access to a key before any writer has used it. So, so for example, uh, let's see, uh, at T2, T3, and T4 can interoperate independent of um, which version of the key set they have access to. Right. Um, and then so it goes on, and we introduce a new key. At, at K2 gets introduced, um, where is it? At T2, and then it progresses through the states. Right. And going back to K1, uh, key version K1, um, you know, based on um, the window, uh, the rotation frequency, and the, uh, the detail that we have this thing, we, like I said, we derive the number of. Uh, one minute. Okay. And. Um, we roll through the uh, this thing, right? And then the schedule for revocation is held. You know, we hold it for one more generation so that if clients were to use it, they would still be able to access the data. We would alert them so we wouldn't lose the data. Um, for many of Google systems, uh, such as Bigtable, the, the, uh, the, the ciphertext detail is enforced because we keep rewriting the data every time a compaction happens. Right? Um, so one other thing that we need to do is uh, mitigating for hardware faults. Uh, Crypto provides leverage, right? It can amplify errors. If you had a single bit error in a wrapping of a data encryption key, you could end up losing a whole bunch of data. And so we need to defend against you know, <coughs> broken CPUs, NICs, twiddling bits, cosmic rays, right? So apart from all the uh, hardware level um, ECC and so on that we uh, check something, we also have at the software layer, we verify the crypto ops at startup. We after wrapping the data encryption keys, we unwrap them before we respond to ensure that we can actually, this is actually reversible. And uh, storage services end up reading back their data in plain text after writing encryption. Right? And they also replicate one level up. So even if one region were to go down, you would have it. Um, so anyway, that's a summary. So uh, we need to do this at scale. It's not just the crypto. There's a whole lot of other work that has to go into it before it's usable. Um, and for us, that's meant you know, multiple lines of availability. Um, the first few best practices listed there are you know, pretty standard. 
um, site SRE workflows, and what do you do, uh, best practices. The last few are things that were specific to key management. Right. And I have a few links at the back. So. Thank you. Good. Do, we, do we have time? Yeah. Great. Any, any questions for Anand? Yeah, Ian. Hi, thanks. When you're talking about key hear. rotation, are you talking about the data encryption keys being rotated or the key encrypting keys being rotated or the level above that even? In, in this case, it was the key encrypting keys. Key encrypting keys. So the data encrypting keys generally don't change. The cipher tech doesn't change. You just change what they're encrypting. So, okay, that's... Data encryption do get changed. Remember when I said every time uh, a block gets rewritten, let's say for because being copied or replicated or whatever, you end up generating a separate a key, key. Okay. a brand new key. So, so those get rotated. Those get rotated. Okay. Great. Is there any use of threshold crypto for the key encryption key? No. So it's just a single. Uh, right key now it's right now it's right, right now it's just symmetric. Uh, I hope I understood what threshold crypto means. Whether this is the N of N of K. No, no, it's not. We don't do it. We just pure symmetric. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions? What? Why don't why aren't you using threshold encryption for protecting the key encryption keys? I should ask one of my cryptographer colleagues to answer that question. I have no clue. Uh, okay. but maybe I, mean, I mean, I mean, just being just being facetious, though, right? For our uh, security model, we don't need it. Uh, the number of people who have access to that thing is in the order of tens. Um, it's, it's verified builds. You cannot. Actually, we do use PKI for the uh, um, for the uh, 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 service identity management, but not for this. Uh, one of my Bodo might have a better answer if he's around. Oh, Ben. So let's take one more yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the key key rolling over um, operations, you might have you, you had in your example you had four different keys in use at one time. Um, is there something tagging the data to say this was version two of the key, or does the application have to manage which version of the key no. is used for decryption? Sure. Uh, so the question was, um, given that a key set has multiple key versions, does the application need to manage uh, which key version was used to encrypt which data block? Uh, no, because it's integrated into the, um, the uh, the crypto libraries that I mentioned earlier, which has been released in open source. So when the ciphertext is generated, we tag it with the um, with a little, um, with basically a tag that tells you which of the key versions was used, um, and it's a it's a, it's a, trunc it's a truncated hash of the, the key, so you can recover. Um, so you don't have to basically <coughs> decrypt using you know uh, all the key versions that you have access to. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. Great. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks. All right. Got the